Hello there, welcome to the second video by Battle Machines. On Facebook and through our website, we have been covering defense matters for more than a decade. We are now trying to reach new audiences through new mediums and platforms that helps us get the message across. This video will be about how aircraft carrier combat has changed in the 21st century. The aircraft carrier scene has heated up in the last two decades, especially in Asia. Here is a list of countries and their current aircraft carriers planned or in service. Japan is converting its two Kaga-class helicopter carriers to proper aircraft carriers. The US has 11 plus, the WASP, and America class. The Chinese have multiple carriers in service. The UK has two in service, albeit barely used to full capability due to lack of own jets. India has two, and plans for more. South Korea is planning to build dedicated carriers while also converting its Dokdo class amphibious assault ships. The French are building a much larger 75,000-ton nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Aircraft carrier is a generic term used for vessels that have expansive full-length flight decks which can be used for coordinated and regular air operations of multiple types of aircraft. These types of vessels were researched about and saw massive development in years leading up to World War II and then after it. Currently, the navies around the world have settled on three types of basic design concepts. Cato bar or catapult assisted takeoff but, arrested recovery like Nimitz class. These have angled landing area with three to four cables that aircraft hook onto while landing. Their catapults are mounted on the bow and end of the angled decks. Stow bar is in short or ski jump takeoff but, arrested recovery like Admiral Kuznetsov class. These also have angled decks with cables but, have a ski jump which can be used by high thrust to weight aircraft to fly off of. Stow VL is in short or ski jump takeoff, vertical landing like HMS Queen Elizabeth class. These might or might not have a ski jump but always lack angled decks, except conversions, and no cables as jets land vertically. In World War II, the primary carrier aircraft were torpedo carriers, fighters and dive bombers. Aircraft had to be in visual range to use their weapons, well within the range of anti-aircraft guns on the ships. This, with circling combat air patrol over the enemy fleets meant large formations of fighters, torpedo carriers and dive bombers had to be sent to ensure hits. This has now wildly changed due anti-ship missiles which can be launched from beyond visual range. Ships these days have surface-to-air missiles and powerful radars to snuff out enemy aircraft at long ranges. What hasn't changed at all is that all naval think tanks agree that whoever detects the enemy first, gets a better chance of scoring first hits. This puts a lot of weight in detection and counter-detection working to identify the entire fleet and its weaknesses. Also, what hasn't changed is basics of fleet tactics. The Imperial Japanese liked to keep the fleet together while the Americans liked to keep them distributed. Keeping them together required less resources to guard and replenish, also easy to form concentrated aircraft formations without radio. It made less sense when discovered, as the entire fleet could be spotted if one vessel was seen, as happened at Midway. The US way was difficult to execute without radios but made sure that the entire fleet wasn't located in one go, while also being resource intensive to support. Onboard aircraft are primarily used for detection of other naval assets in the region in peacetime. When crap hits the proverbial fan, they are also used to strike and defend against threats that might be in the way to achieving the goals of the operation. We will dive into these roles one by one in the upcoming slides. Please note we will be concentrating on naval jet fighters only, in this video. Imagine a naval vessel that has powerful radars that can detect a fighter-sized target at 200 kilometers, that is great, right? It just means that at 200 kilometers the returns from the target are strong enough for the sensors on the vessels to detect the fighter. The emissions however can be detected at ranges far beyond the ones strong enough to register on the side of the emitter. It means that a fighter flying with no emissions at 250 kilometers might still detect the ship, but the ship might not see the jet. Modern radar warning receivers can even warn if the returns are strong enough for detection or if there is a radar lock. Plus, Friendly naval vessels are also limited by radar horizons so it will be difficult for them to look for anything very low but far away. Aircraft can fly high and carefully navigate around targets to maintain contact while not being detected. This means, a jet fighter can only use its radar warning receiver and other passive sensors looking for targets beyond visual range without emitting radio energy. Given the speed and sensitivity of modern systems, it is easy peasy to cover massive areas in a single sortie. Multiply it with a combat spread of 1,800 meters or 1 nautical mile separation, and you can triangulate target position based on radio energy. A surface vessel needs hours to get out of detection range or below sea level radar horizon. 
the jet fighter can do it in seconds if not minutes. If chances of detection are high, they can just dip below the radar horizon of the enemy vessel and hide using the Earth's curvature. These detection capabilities can also be used for battle damage assessment. I mean if the target keeps emitting after the time of arrival of missiles, it wasn't hit and is healthy to fight. Seeking targets is tough but eliminating them is tougher. You need to plan according to the enemy, its radar systems, its air defenses and the operating conditions. It is called mission packaging where you define each parameter to help you get the best outcome. Most modern naval fighters have some or the other primary anti-ship missile so choosing the weapon is the easy part. Choosing how many and how to use them is difficult. But aircraft are infinitely flexible platforms compared to a naval vessel. A naval vessel needs hours and days to get into position, compared to hours and minutes for an aircraft. So you can use an aircraft as a spotter for naval platforms that are within missile range but outside strike back range. For example a Tomahawk missile can hit targets 1,500 kilometers away, if your enemy cannot detect you at that distance, you can position a ship to launch the missile and a jet serves as a spotter by checking the emissions. They can also act as escorts providing jamming support to avoid unwanted detection while en route. For aircraft launched missiles, it is more difficult but less risky. An aircraft can duck beneath the radar horizon and launch missiles very close to the target ensuring late detection of the platform in the missile. Going up against an enemy carrier is obviously very difficult and a whole different ballgame. We will discuss it in the next section. Aircraft have their own radars and missiles for self-defense and offense against assets. This helps a lot and I mean infinitely more against modern sea skimming missiles. Since jet fighters fly high, their radar horizons at surface are much farther than a surface vessel. This means they can spot sea skimming missiles flying in below with look down capabilities. With their onboard missiles, they can target the missiles while also alerting their mothership about the attack. More jets can then be launched to intercept incoming salvos and reduce the load on individual ships. Or else, Data link targeting like US Navy's NIFCCA can be used to use shipboard missiles to target threats beyond the range of shipborne sensors. It is also a difficult thing to master though, US Navy with its carrier-based tankers and long-ranged F-14s had trouble maintaining a 400 nautical mile bubble to keep out Soviet bombers attempting saturation attacks. It comes down to using limited range of aircraft as efficiently as possible to counter as many threats as possible. With the three primary roles of carrier fixed-wing aviation defined, let us take on the elephant in the room. How do carriers fight each other? Time and again, it has been said that the carrier that detects first, shoots first and kills first. That means fighters have to be used for detection work. Usually fighters with a longer range will have an upper hand as they can cover larger areas or keep their mothership farther away. Carrier-based aerial refueling like buddy tankers can also help increase this range further. Non-carrier surface vessels thus face a unique challenge, use radars to detect and give away your location or keep quiet and let the aviation do its job. Planning attacks is very difficult though. You need to keep an eye on all aspects of the enemy CBG, as in its submarines, its surface vessels and their onboard capabilities. Then comes the important task of gauging how they are employing their own air wing and find a way in, to launch your missiles. You need to evade enemy combat air patrol to get in range for missile launch. These are very complex decisions for mission planners and it needs to be done quickly before the other party detects you or attacks you. There are more questions which are even difficult to answer. Do they launch all jets in one wave, plus two to four for own cap, or launch in two waves of smaller numbers? Especially problematic for smaller carriers with 24 jets. How many jets to use as buddy tankers? How and when to deploy remaining air assets for defense or as a second wave? Do they send mixture formations with some only as escort? and others with anti-ship missiles or send all with anti-ship missiles? Do they close the range between CBGs or go farther? How to employ surface vessels to help with aircraft strikes? Well, this is how admirals and fleet commanders make their paycheck and salaries. Until next time, this was Epsilon, see you in the next video.